Assassins family, and welcome to another edition of What is the Time, a podcast about personal sovereignty, celestial timing, and living where the getting is good. I am your boy Zamboni, your DJ for the affair, where we be getting down and won't be coming up for air. I thank y'all so much for being here another time with me. We got a good one lined up for you today. I got my, uh, I got somebody very interesting lined up today. I'm very excited about the, uh, the conversation that we're about to have about um, getting into different ways of thinking, maybe even non-human ways of thinking and finding ways through uh, a chaotic time by listening to those who uh, may have another perspective than we have today. I have uh, Megan Kaminsky with me, who is a professor at KU of creative writing, and um, but who has also written a couple of books of poetry, as well as um, when I met Megan, it was because um, she was doing a um, a talk at the Unbound Book Festival, which was, so that talk was about uh, witchcraft in literature. And um, Megan was there, <clears throat> excuse me, Megan was there um, doing a talk on um, her new oracle deck, which is called Prairie Divination, which is super rad. And um, so it's an oracle deck, which is um based in the prairie and i rather than describing it myself maybe it would be best for you to uh talk a little bit about what what it is that you do and how you came to what you've created here and how you came to do that would you are you interested in that i'd be happy to um thank you and thank you for that beautiful entry into into this space um so the prairie divination deck i have i brought I have them here with me. Um, Ooh, fun. Um, it is a collaboration with um, Alan Wheeler, who's the artist who did all of the, all of the beautiful um, their elect their digital watercolors um, for the for all the plants and animals and minerals and elements in the book. And the idea of the deck is that instead of tarot, which is based in um, early modern and medieval uh, European traditions, French and Italian traditions, and that set of stories and knowledges, I was thinking about what would happen if we turned to our own ecosystem. So I live, I'm I'm at Bashan Island in Washington State right now at an artist residency, but um, I live in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, and have lived there for the last 16 years. Um, and Lawrence is part of the Tallgrass Prairie ecosystem. And it's an ecosystem that once covered a great deal of North America, um, up through Saskatchewan, down through um, down through Texas, and that has mostly um, disappeared due to agricultural uh, cultivation, due to development of homes and cities, um, but it was mostly destroyed by European settlers um, in the 19th century. So um, thinking about this ecosystem and thinking about, instead of looking to these other stories of how we should live in the world, what would happen if we started listening to the wisdom of the plants and animals around us and we connect to that instead? So for me, it it came out of a really personal desire um, to find a home and to know what it meant to be at home somewhere. Um, hmm. My immediate family and also my uh, my immediate um my immediate blood family, family of origin, and um, also extended through ancestors. Um, there's just really a history of rupture and leaving um, places and this disconnect. And I knew that wasn't the way that I wanted to be in the world, but I didn't have guides to, um, to show me how to connect differently. So when I moved to, when I moved to Kansas, I just started spending a lot of time, um, in the tall grass prairie and listening and learning about the plants. I didn't know anything. My training is as a creative writer, um, and in literature. So it was really this process of discovery. And I started just taking all these notes and taking photographs and, 
as that happened, I just started connecting to people who, who share that space and, you know, uh, whether it's botanists, um, Kelly Kincher, who's an ethnobotanist at KU, um, but um, also uh, Carmen Moreno, who is an artist who was based in Kansas City, um, who started the Earth Body Project and thinking about um, methods of interacting with the natural world and learning from the natural world that were that were purposely uh, decolonizing and changing our relationships. So. Um, making friends with plants and animals, um, making friends with people who were just as devoted to that place as I was becoming and learning about, um, learning about that, this place, um, and plants. And also I got completely nerdy and I started, um, talking with, uh, Dr. Carrie Wessinger, who is a postdoc studying floral pollinator syndrome. So she's an evolutionary biologist and, um, yeah, we just started talking over drinks at a happy hour and kept meeting with her and um, sharing the things I was thinking about and learning, learning a lot from her. So it's, I guess the project is part of this, like, I don't know, decade and a half long inquiry of how to be of a place, how to belong to a place, how to be at home, mm. how to... Um, also be a part of providing home for others um, and creating space for others rather than just um, an extractive relationship from place. Cool. That's so rad. That's, that's so interesting that, um, so you came into this uh, creative arts project by way of uh, searching for home. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's interesting to me because, uh, for a couple of reasons, because, um, so through, so you live in, uh, the middle of Kansas, which is also where, um, that's where, uh, I have a lot of family and, um, it's the, so my family on my mom's side, uh, are Prairie Band Potawatomi people. And so there's, there, there's a reservation nearby. And, uh, my uncle used to teach at Haskell right there in, uh, Lawrence and this kind of thing. And so, um, and so that, that has been interesting to me because um, also, so Citizen Band Potawatomi person is uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who uh, wrote the fantastic book Braiding Sweetgrass, which everyone should go out and buy right now. Um, and I've, I've given that book away maybe 15 times or something like this. It's like, it's so good. I don't even have a copy right now because I keep giving it away. But, um, but it's so good. And, um, and so one of the things that she comes to early early in that book is a um there, there's a sense of becoming indigenous and um and sort of thinking about indigeneity outside of like ethnicity and more into ways of being or ways of uh behaving or thinking and um like modes of understanding uh, where we are and who we are relative to our relatives, the others who live here. And it seems like your process was a pretty organic one of like sitting and um, listening. And so I would love to hear you sort of talk about your process a little bit. Sure. I mean, I think there are definitely some parallels and um, Dr. Kimmerer's work has been so important. She's one of the people I think as a teacher in, in the um, divination, the prairie divination book. Um, hmm. but yeah. So I think, and I teach her work. I I'm um, also a professor of environmental studies and uh, I teach her work on moss and also braiding sweetgrass. And she's a beautiful essay of the, about the tall grass prairie too, um, which some people haven't read. And I just, I, it's really special. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I started out, I didn't think I was going to, this deck came out of, I had been doing all this research for myself and finding home and finding place and wanting to be a good teacher um, at the university, not wanting to come in and have like this outside of place extractive relationship with um both physically the place I'm living, um, but also with the um, with the students. I mean, the University of Kansas is a public university, and it's 
wonderful. And I was teaching these students who've lived, many of whom have lived in Kansas their whole lives. And I was really cognizant of the things that I didn't know coming in as someone who hadn't been there and wanting, making it my job to, to learn what it, what it is to be, you know, to be of this space, um, and to be of this place too, and thinking about ways to share that and invite students. So I was thinking originally, I mean, I was just writing a bunch of poems, um, and thinking that was going to happen. And as I was teaching, I realized that most of my students weren't familiar with the tall grass prairie, um, either that they hadn't been out there. They, some of them lived you know, um, in Emporia. So right outside of this huge national prairie preserve, and they'd never been there before. And I taught um, Dr. Kimmerer's essay on the tall grass prairie, and it was a revelation for them, um, for a lot of students. And I was thinking about ways in which, um, I mean, there are so many barriers for being outside and for, and who's welcome in outdoor spaces and who feels comfortable in outdoor spaces and who has access to outdoor spaces. And um, I was thinking about ways to bring that, to make that more accessible, to make that um, in it. So I thought about the, the book in the deck as an invitation in that way. Um, in an invitation to interact. And I think, yeah, I mean, for me, I guess the perspective that I'm entering through the project, that I entered through the project was maybe one of uh, queer ecology um, and thinking about, um, about as a divination practice, thinking about what it would mean if I'm not going to be able to contact connect to my um my family of origin right my ancestral lineage in that way what it would mean to connect maybe with a queer lineage right um a chosen family and i guess there's a way what i which i started thinking about the plants as my chosen family too um and thinking about ways that those relationships that altering who who I consider um, to be persons, right? To be um, sentient beings, to be um, to be subjects, right? Rather than background or objects um, or landscape, which is how we think of plants a lot. Um, how that really changed my relationship with them, but also my relationship with myself, my relationship with the world. And I think it's a practice that, I mean, I've been so influenced by um, by by Dr. Kimmer's work and thinking about traditional ecological knowledges. I've been so influenced and inspired by Black feminist theory and thinking. Um, Adrienne Marie Brown, uh, Alexis Pauline Gums, um, Sadia Hartman. I mean, all of these, all of these women. Uh, their, their work has been so important and I feel like they've been my teachers too. So I think there are lots of different ways of trying to take apart and repair our relationships um, mm -hmm. with, with the more than human world and those relationships that have been shaped and harmed. Um, I don't think irreparably, I think there's a lot of possibility of repair, but through colonialism, through white supremacy. And I think there are lots of different ways um, that, that that we can do that, right? Where we can look for those repairs and connections. But my personal practices, I guess, would really be thinking about, about um, addressing them from a practice of connecting to queer ancestral traditions, um, maybe thinking about disability culture too, and thinking about ways in which um, my personal embodiments in those ways give me access and connection. Um, so I guess that's my perspective, but I, I really hope that the work that I'm doing and the thinking that I'm doing is alongside. It's something that we're that a lot of us are doing right now and feeling like the real urgency for this kind of work. Hmm, mm hmm. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things that you said there uh, really resonated with me in that um, 
my whole life and perspective changed when I stopped thinking about plants as resource and started thinking about plants as friends. Like everything shifted in that moment. I can remember there was a day when that happened and I was like, oh, this like this changes everything. And so then to go on to uh, remember terms like relatives, for example, and um, and then digging into ancestral tradition. And there's no way to uh, look at ancestry and not ultimately arrive at plants as ancestors, right? They're just, they, they literally are the oldest people in the world. They, or I'm, uh, you know, beyond stones maybe, or the, the water or, uh, you know, sunlight or something like this, but, um, but they are much older than we are and, uh, and predate humanity by a wide margin, right? And so, um, um, so there's, you know, so in noticing that and sort of feeling that and moving into that kind of head space and feeling space, um, I think that it's, uh, it has been extremely valuable to me um, in, you know, working on repairing relationships or, or even stepping into relationships. One of the things that you said earlier is like, it's very easy to live in Kansas your whole life and not spend any time in the tall grass prairie, right? And this is true about wherever, wherever you might live, you know, like you, it's very easy to not spend, even if you spend time outside, then, um, you know, like a lot of uh, farming folks will spend a bunch of time on their monocrop agriculture uh, farms or, or this kind of thing, you know what I mean? And so, um, so you don't really necessarily have the experience of being out in a place that might be called wild or something like this, right? Yes, beautiful people. Thank you so much for listening to me and Megan talk about uh, the ways of being with plants and stuff like that. Thank you for being here with us. Um, if you would like to support this, the whole production event, I would super appreciate it. There's many, many ways you can do that. You can always send a tip by Venmo Cash App PayPal. That is the easiest, most direct way to send support. You know, uh, I'm working on a book now. It looks like it's probably going to be self-published. So there's there's, there's just a lot of fees associated with that with copy editing and cover design and formatting and all of the rest of it printing all all of that so if you want to send me 10 bucks that way that's super helpful or there are other things you can do as well you can get a 10 minute reading video reading just like this um, and it just like the weeklies basically and you can get a reading about your chart and I'll talk about the transits or whatever you feel like uh, you would like me to talk about about your chart and um, if, since you see this ad here in this Prairie Divination episode, if you put in the discount code Prairie Divination, um, that'll be like floating around here somewhere, the, then uh, you can take five bucks off of that. So um, that's just for watchers and listeners of the podcast. So thank you so much for being here. Prairie Divination uh, is the discount code that will get you five bucks off that uh, reading. You can also get uh, an hour long reading, a Zoom reading um, with me there at... Um, at the website zambonifong.com you can also there's a whole bunch of really cool merch there's like really great um like artwork that was made by my friend odd Mind. so like this the breathe poster is super dope and huge look at this thing it's huge it's amazing so I love that. I um, I put one in my uh, niece's bedroom. Uh, she really loves pink, and I wanted her to have a literal goddess of breath uh, looking after her for her childhood. And so she's got that in there. Um, you know, I there's there's tote bags with um, the cover to can't help myself or breathe. That that is a thing going on here. You can get a mug. Mm. Just. Everything is more delicious when it's so beautiful like this. Um, there's there's a whole bunch of stuff. There's um, shirts. You can get a t-shirt. You can get a hoodie. You can get all type of stuff. So there's a there's a whole bunch of Zamboni Funk merch that's available there at ZambonifunkCom store. Thank you so much for supporting in whatever ways you can. I can't offer you a discount the, on uh, any of the like physical merchandise. It's uh, the profit margin on it is really low, and so I, if I offer any discount at all, basically basically, then um, I'll just end up paying for it. But um, the art is super cool. 
And that's part of the reason why I take such a low profit on it because uh, I just want this art, which is made by my friend Odd Minds. You should follow her on Instagram. Um, you, th I just want that art to be out in the world. Um, and so, and then also you can always um, go for free to Spotify, Title Pandora, Apple Music, wherever you like to get your music at, and listen to the music that this artwork represents. Um, and that is super helpful to me as well. So thank you for doing those things. Let's get back to listening to Megan be brilliant. I think it's uh, interesting for you to have developed an Oracle deck, um, which is, you know, so one of the things that I think is going on here is that like, um, whenever we get into a place of divination, then it is frequently good. It, it sort of changes the way that you think, like the, the uh, order that thoughts can come to you and um, how you might treat thoughts and images and this kind of thing. And so it's really interesting um, to include um, local plant life in that process. And so I'm, I'm interested in both the development of that as well uh, toward the creation of the, the deck, as well as how that has developed for you since the deck has been created. Presumably you keep the, the deck around you and do readings from time to time and this kind of thing. So like, how has that been for you? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I guess I don't know where to start. Um, my relationship with the deck has been beautifully surprising to me. Um, I actually enjoy doing readings for myself um, and frequently do. And part of me was like, am I, what's it gonna be like to read something that, you know, do readings from something that I created, you know, I and it um, surprises me how much I feel like I'm still learning from the um, the friends of the prairie that that make themselves make themselves known to me um through the deck um and i think i don't know i mean there's i think divination is about this practice of uncertainty right and for asking opening mm -hmm. up to something bigger than you and opening up to the mystery right of the world um but i think what i'm realizing and i've been thinking a lot at this residency and Thinking a lot, I, I picked up this shell today, and I don't know, the shell fits in my hands, and I there's just something holding, it's a scallop shell, and um, holding holding the shell and feeling like this, this opening, and thinking about, there's the mystery outside, but there's also the mystery inside of us, and I think that they're connected, and I, I keep thinking about them breathing back into each other. So I think that divination is in a lot of ways, the practice of divination of is a giving up control, giving up the, you know, the rigid boundaries, not in a bad way, but the rigidity of, you know, containing oneself and whether it's you know, for however long, welcoming in some some other some other information and knowledges. So that's something I came into, but didn't really. I don't know. I grew up. Um, I was raised by atheists, um, and mm. uh, my my father went to Catholic high school, and I think it turned him not Catholic anymore. So um, I I was raised like being afraid of or embarrassed by the idea of thinking about something larger than myself. And I hmm. think going into academia, that's like an extra level of, you know, looking for the rational. Um, mm -hmm. so when I entered into this interest in plants, I mean, I was doing it from this really philosophical um, orientation and thinking about um, and not an ex, I, maybe a little expansive, but thinking about what does it mean for a plant to think? How might a plant feel things? So really thinking about it, you know, looking at signals that plants send to, to themselves and to each other and really looking for scientific documentation, studying plant biology, um, studying, there's this great uh, philosopher, Michael Martyr, who writes about 
plants. Um, and I entered in that way, but as I was working in that practice and as I started, um, I became friends with, um, an ethnobotanist, um, at, who teaches at KU. Um, and he started bringing me, um, these, these plants, these, some of the plants that I had been studying was interested in. I started planting them and caring for them in my backyard. I really realized that my practice of observation and my practice of study was also a practice of care. And that mm. through that care, whether it was studying plants, talking to people who knew more than I did, um, learning about them that way, or spending time in the tall grass prairie and writing poems and taking pictures and writing notes, or um, actually tending to the plants myself, it was a practice of care. And that that was a practice that was deeply healing for me personally, um, but also I think really healing for our relationships with community and learning how to be present for someone thinking about plants whose needs are so different than my own and mm. who communicates in a way that's so different than the way I communicate. And there are ways in which I'm never going to be able to experience what they experience, but I care so deeply for them that I figure out how, how to do that, right? Like not to understand, but to support them and to support their growth. And in doing that practice, um, I think that's where the deck came out of. Um, and I started working and thinking about it and then collaborating with Leslie. And um, this was right before the um, pandemic started. And I really wrote a lot of the entries as essays during the lockdown stages um, of the pandemic in the first year um, and thinking about the things that I needed to hear, but the things that I wish I could say to others. Um, and I think that's the lens that the information. So I was spending a lot of time with with plants and animals and in my backyard and also, you know, taking taking you know day trips out to the prairie. Um, but I think I was deeply searching for that kind of those relationships of care. And um that opened up opened me up for receiving the kinds those kinds of knowledges. Hmm. 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 That's, uh, that's really beautiful. I, um, I like your focus on the word care there. And, um, I, I wonder a little bit about what you mean by that. Yeah. yeah let's start there. I mean, oh, um, when I think about care, I mean, I think about love, um, and when I'm thinking about love, I'm thinking about love in the sense of maybe of grace in that mm. love that doesn't have to be earned, love that everyone is deserving of, regardless of, you know, who they are or what our relationships are with them. So I think about care coming out of this deep, this deep certainty, right, that that everyone is deserving of care, of being supportive, of having their needs tended to, um, of mm -hmm. being in relation, right? And sometimes that's hard. I mean, I was just in um, a beautiful meditation uh, session with um, Janice Lee, who's a writer and just beautiful thinker. Um, and she was thinking about like what it would mean to um, breathe with and think about like, you know, rats and people have, you know, problems with a rat in their house. What, but, you know, extending that generosity, extending that sense mm. of um, what Thich Nhat Hanh would call interbeing, right? This idea that we all, that I'm maybe myself, but I'm also a part of this much larger web of life in the world, in the universe. And that, you know, in really beautiful ways that I'm never alone. Um, but also that I also have all these responsibilities. And I, I think they're good responsibilities, but yeah. 
Hmm. 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 That's so interesting there. Um, so when you've been talking about care and home, you know, I'm an astrologer. That's like how I, uh, that's what I spend all my time doing. And um, so when I think about care as well as home, then uh, I typically think about the moon and I think about cancer, which is ruled by the moon. And so there's a sense here, um, you know, uh, coming back to things that uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer told me, um, there is... So the the, um, the word part eco comes from the Greek oikos, which means home. And so if we think about ecology, then that is the study of home. But then also economy comes from that same term. And so there's it's it's like this feeling of divergence there. And it's interesting because uh, astrology and astronomy comes from the same or like runs into that same sort of divergence where you sort of like, um, you know, you, there's the like mystics on the one side and the the scientists on the other as we, you know, or the the, the rational ones on the other side. And so you look like you have something to say about that. Oh, I mean, I, I like both. I, I like, I, sure. I, I imagine being in the environmental studies department. I don't know if my colleagues think about this, but I, I think of part of my role doing eco-cultural studies and eco-arts practices is joining, like inviting the spirit in to the science and to like the very material realities of the world. So, yeah. Yeah. So I'm actually interested in, because I, I understand that you um, are a poet and a writer, and then you find yourself suddenly being qualified as a, an environmental studies kind of person, right? Like, uh, and that, that's kind of like surprising to you. That was, that was an unexpected venture for you. Is that right? I mean, I've been, I do eco-cultural studies and eco-arts practices, so I don't actually do the scientific. So I, okay. I really look at so yes yes it was it, the surprising thing to me and the beautiful thing was that i was invited to join this program and mm. that these people who have backgrounds so different from mine you know almost all of them are scientists and social scientists um mm -hmm. research mm -hmm. faculty in the department and you know i just got invited i'm going to be co-teaching a class in the spring with a soil biologist um mm. and she was like i want to teach a class in ecological restoration. But when I was at my national conference, everyone was talking about how important that we don't just think about the resilience of soil and land, but we also think about how that can teach us resilience. And mm. she, I talked to, um, she talked to our associate chair and he was like, oh yeah, that's Megan. That's what Megan studies. <laughs> so, so there's something just beautiful. And I guess, it's not that surprising to me, but um, there's something just really beautiful about being invited into those conversations and into that community. Um, and I think that um, a lot of times in the universities and the academy, there's a sense that, you know, the humanities and the sciences and they, you know, and it's, there's really this openness. Um, I, yeah. Mm. Um, Peggy and I have both, Peggy Schultz, who's going to be teaching class, both keep talking about how much we're going to learn from each other. And, you know, to, I, I think as people have been doing this for a while to say that, that it just feels like a space, right. To always be learning and yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Great. So this is where I was going is, um, so what I'm hearing here is that, um, Although there may be a sort of um, cultural expectation that science bros are not going to be so into the sort of philosophical plants can talk side of things, that has not been your experience. In, in life, it has been more that uh, in the sciences, there's an openness to plant cognition and uh, some of the more woo divination sort of things. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? I think so. And I don't know if there's an openness, like a personal belief, but I think there's an openness I think there's a realization and a growing realization in the sciences that the things we think about objective fact are just as shaped by our cultural constructions um, as, as anything else. And, 
you know, I'm teaching a queer ecology class in the fall. And a lot of our ideas of gender, um, of sexuality, really, we think of them as being scientific, but they're projected onto, I mean, I don't think plants are like, male or you know have male and female parts but we talk about them that way right and mm. there are all these examples in the natural world of queer of intersex of non-binary plants animals organisms asexual reproduct all of these going on and it's really our cultural construction right that like says well there's boy animal who meets a girl animal and that's how you know that that's us putting that onto it and i think that scientists have known this for years, right? Because they're actually spending time thinking about this. And um, I think there's an opening, right? For an uh, idea, like I don't have to understand the nuts and bolts science to understand the, the work my colleagues are, is the work that my colleagues are doing is really valuable, right? I can appreciate it. I can support it and get excited about without like deeply understanding. And I think there's that similar level of respect and seeing just, you know, hearing students talk about what it means to have a personal relationship with land and place and thinking about um, these broader ways of bringing that into our daily life. So even if they're not doing it or don't completely get what I'm talking about, or, you know, I think there's, I think there's a respect and a, a, a general, I think we, I don't know, maybe not. I feel like there's a sense that we're aware of the crisis of the current moment, right? Whether it's climate crisis, whether it's um, racial and wealth inequality, whether it is uh, thinking about I don't know, the cultural, cultural world's going on around the the basic right for, for trans folks to exist. I mean, it really feels like we're in this moment where we have to change the way we think to communicate with each other and to, to open up those conversations um, for, for the survival of, you know, of all of us, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if if we can imagine a person who is just now hearing about ecology as the study of home and who maybe is not who uh, this might be the first time they've heard something about uh, plants as friends or something like this. Right. Then. Um, so to my mind. Uh, and part of the reason why I love the practice of divination so much is because there's something really fundamental about the question itself. Like it, it feels like the universe itself is made of question, right? And so there's this kind of like investigative response to question that is that constitutes life, right? And so um, for someone who is in that space, um, what are the kinds of questions that you like to ask or like to think with in order to move toward a better relationship with land uh, and plant people, et cetera? I mean, I think we're all really invested in these questions, even if we don't realize that we are, you know, mm -hmm. it could just be as basic as how, you know, what's going on with your power bill this summer, <laughs> you know, or um, people, I mean, for me, it's finding a place of connection. And that goes across all sorts of different experiences, orientations. Um, but, you know, if someone cares, really enjoys skiing, that's an easy way to start thinking about, well, What's it like skiing right now? Like, how's your, you know, how has the season changed since you were a kid? Or thinking about the trees in in your neighborhood, right? Or thinking about, I mean, I think we're all interacting with the more than human world in really deeply personal ways, even if we don't know that we are. I mean, I think people's relationships with their companion animals, right? You know, if you love your dog, that's like caring for 
right? Another being um, in a way that I guess they reciprocate by giving you love and companionship, but it's in some ways this, this altruistic care, right? For someone very different than you. And I think for a while, a lot of people who do the kind of work I do in the academy were really nervous about, you know, don't anthropomorphize, um, don't look at that animal and think you know. But I think we have to. I mean, that's the way we're people. We're, I mean, we're mm. human people. I'm not going to stop being a human person. Um, I hope not. I mean, I, I think that would <laughs> mean I would not exist. Um, so, but coming from that space, like being able to hold simultaneously, I think this is where divination can be really useful. Um, I think about this, my, my entry into div divinatory practices was um, studying with also through astrology. And I started studying with Chani Nicholas um, before she was, <laughs> before she was an app and she used to send things mm. out via Dropbox. Um, yeah. But um, that was my introduction. But this, this sense in which like the stars give us on the moment that we're born, give us this map of our lives, but how that plays out, you don't know until the end of your life, right? Or maybe even beyond that, how how that's going to play out. So it's like being able to hold simultaneously in the case of plants or animals, right? A plant or animal people that I can try to know everything I can about them and try to feel with them and look at, like I look at my cat and I'm like, oh, you know, are you lonely? Are you sad? What is it that you need? And that I to the best of my abilities connect in that way, but also know that things are unknowable to me. Um, like she gets bad allergies and it looks like she's crying and she's she's not, my vet assured me she's not crying. <laughs> she just has allergies. So, you know, being able to hold those things simultaneous, we do that all the time. I mean, we do that with our, our partners. We do that with our children, right? There are ways... And just our friends, there are ways that I can never fully know another person, but that, and it's important that I remember that, but I also think if I didn't try, if I wasn't, you know, deeply invested in that, um, I'd really be missing out on a lot. Hmm, hmm, for sure, for sure. Yeah, the way that you talk about uh, caring for your cat and um and these plants it's sort of so um you know if we think about the moon and cancer as being on one side then the opposite to that and we can think about opposition as a as being a very strong tethered relationship right um there's a there maybe can be like a can't live with them can't live without them kind of situation going on with that with an opposition and so the opposite to the moon in cancer even in the theme of mundi is saturn in capricorn right and so if we think about saturn as rising so yeah sorry oh yeah so you know all about that <laughs> no, where's your Saturn if you if you don't mind me asking? That, uh, in the ninth house in a yeah, in the ninth house. Okay. Word up. Sure. Hey, yeah. It, it makes sense what I do, I think. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. It always makes sense. It's uh, it. Who knew that astrology was real? Um, <laughs> but um, but if we think about uh, Saturn and Capricorn as being the opposite, you know, um, of, of uh, the moon in Cancer. Right. So you uh, spoke at length about um, care and what care means. And there's there's this kind of uh, nurturing and soft, uh, unconditional love that you described there. Right. Um, and then also that is juxtaposed against responsibility and uh, the, the sort of necessity of care. Like um, if I am a part of this wider network of life, then it is my responsibility to take care of the things that I need to take care of. And so um, this is a really interesting sort of uh, juxtaposition here and so I wonder, um, you know, so currently in this moment where we are right now, which is uh, July 31st, 2023. Um, and so we're in the middle of this like Venus retrograde in Leo. 
and um, we're coming up on a, a full moon in Aquarius, right? And so one of the things that um, on an earlier episode of this podcast with uh, Palace and Cameron, I do a, a quarterly forecast. And so in that episode, we talked about the relationship between Leo and Aquarius. And there's this sort of sense of self and who I am versus collective and like what um, all of us are and this kind of thing, right? And so... Um, I've been thinking about how to navigate where I stop. Cause like sometimes, um, I, I, I saw a tweet recently that was like, um, you know, like me in my workplace, uh, is that's, that's not my responsibility. No, I'm not doing that. And then me lying awake at night is like, I myself have to solve the problem of climate change, you know? And so, um, there's this like feeling there, like how, how, uh, I don't expect you to know, but how do you go about navigating that? And what do you think, um, you have learned from the plant friends in regard to this? Yeah, those are such good questions. I've been thinking about them a lot too. Um, and I think that it's, I think that we think about responsibility as, you know, thinking about care, that opposition. I think, I think in some ways that's a false, I don't know, false dichotomy, but I, and I know this isn't always the case, but I feel joy sometimes. I think that we feel, I think that we assume that caring for others and being responsible for others, I think that we assume that these responsibilities are weights on us. And I think they can be, especially when we think we have to do something alone, right? And it's, but I mean, I also think that they're invitations to connection. Like, and maybe I'm just a weirdo. I really love my cat and I really miss her because I'm away from her. But like, there are moments where I like, scoop her litter box which is not a not a nice task no one gets excited about that but it makes me so happy that i'm taking care of her like i have a real joy mm -hmm. and connection and responsibility in that way and i think i don't think that's just my capricorn rising <laughs> energy happening but you know i think i mean thinking about people like engaging in like litter cleanups in their neighborhood in that sense of joy and responsibility, right, that comes, or when, you know, I'm at the Aldi, and, uh, you know, I've been there, and it's just been like an endless stream of people passing on their carts without asking for their quarterback, and I, it, it, those are like really kind of superficial things, but there's this, I think that our responsibilities to each other also are what connect us and hmm. what I think they're a source of joy. I think they're a source of strength. I think that it's the isolation, right? Like it's that, that critical thinking about, um, thinking about Saturn, that, that isolation, that, that cutting off that, you know, that, that dryness, right. That you can also hmm. associate that I think of as being, yeah, I don't know if I'm making sense at all. I, I think about this stuff a lot though, is my Saturn sits right next to my um, North node and mm -hmm. uh, which puts my South node in Pisces. And I always, my friend Forrest, who's a composer is like, you just want to merge with the universe all the time, Megan. And I was like, yeah, I think I'm not supposed to do that. I think that's what <laughs> it's telling me. So, so, so yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm in this like very, poetic dreamy space thinking about all these things with the um aspects going on last week with the nodes to the north and south nodes and um venus being in retrograde and oof, thinking about the underworld journeys and arash mm -hmm. gal and uh, yeah for sure, for sure. Not, a, not a coherent answer just giving you yeah <laughs> all the all the gemini scatterings <laughs> sure sure yeah you know um i think saturn gets a gets a rap sometimes um that is and so saturn you know saturn definitely can be hermity and this kind of thing um and uh isolated and lonely and grumpy about it um but one thing that cameron said a couple of podcasts or a couple of uh, forecasts ago was um 
the the diff noticing the difference between boundaries and barriers right and saturn does both of those things so saturn can put up walls that stop things from coming in right but sometimes if you put up walls that stop things from coming in and build a tunnel with that then really what you you can do is you can facilitate a connection between this and that place by making sure that only the right things go through it, right? So you can build a tunnel underwater or underground or something like this, and you can facilitate a connection that is um, only possible because the water is not coming in and flooding out your area, right? And so um, I think that that really strongly supports your point here around um, like responsibility is a means toward connection, especially if you can find some joy in it. Like nobody really likes uh, scooping poop, but um, if you can find the the joy, there's a certain joy in um, doing the, the hard thing, like doing hard things or lifting heavy things or um, doing things that maybe others like, a, like your cat is not going to scoop her own poop, right? Um, no, and she's shoot. so happy once I scoop it. Like, right. She goes in and makes another poop and she's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. And really few things are as good as a good poop, right? So, <laughs> um, so there's like, so yeah, being able to find that kind of joy does root itself in discipline and hard work and endurance and the kinds of Saturn things that, um, you know, that are not necessarily associated with isolation. They're just associated with difficulty. Well, and I mean, I think as someone, I don't think it's uncommon, you know much more about this than I do, but I don't think it's uncommon for people who have strong aspects saturn also squares my son um so mm. to have like these difficult relationships with that in an early part of their lives and i think mm -hmm. i had a really difficult relationship thinking about myself as a capricorn rising i'm a leo moon and a gemini sun i'm like oh that's me and then it's like what's this and the thing that i have grown to love and understand is thinking about capricorn as having this insistence to make things material right? This insistence that, you know, to, to bring things into, into being and to do that hard work, right? Um, not mm -hmm. just let it well out in the ether, even though, you know, I love thinking about and feeling things, but it's like how to make that material. And that's mm -hmm. really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that is the way that you describe that there is a really interesting way to also describe taking the ideas and the feelings and the communications that you have with plants and then turn them into something that is material, something that is uh, put it onto the paper. There's illustrations there. There's um, a way for there's some, it's tactile. You can when you're like uh, doing card readings and this kind of thing, then you can spend some time in that space um, and make that. Uh, practically available in a way that Capricorn really likes, right? Re Capricorn really cares about the practicality of it. So maybe people don't necessarily have time to uh, go to the tall grass prairie every day and to, in in the way that uh, indigenous people of of your may have done, right? Like spend their whole lives in the, in, uh, in the field and all this kind of thing, right? Maybe you got a job that you got to go to and whatever, whatever. And so maybe it's not practical for you to do that but it could be practical for you to spend time in this space where the question is real and in the space where the mystery is so profound and in that space maybe you can um spend some time learning thinking being with plant people yeah i mean i wasn't thinking about this when i started making the deck and working on it but um I was remembering back to, I visited my friend, Ann Vickery. She's a poet who's in Australia. And she took us out to, she took me out to Wilson's Promontory, which is this beautiful, it's just gorgeous, gorgeous place. And I, her little boy, Ben, who's no longer a little boy, um, was with us and he was obsessed with Pokemon Go. And he was on his Pokemon just constantly. And I was sitting in the back seat with him as they were driving. He just wanted to Pokemon, Pokemon. And wasn't interested at all. I mean, I, I got to see kangaroos and wombats and all these creatures up close. And it was just like, whoa. And I asked Ben, I was like, 
And he's like, that's a wombat. I'm like, okay. And I was like, who does that wombat remind you of in Pokemon? And suddenly it was like, he had this, it was an invitation to think of the wombat, not just as uh, that thing over there, but like he had this rich imaginary world around his Pokemon creatures. And once he started thinking about what Pokemon the wombat was like, it was like he saw the wombat anew and he saw the wombat as as a person right and he was like Megan I think you should pet the wombat and then afterwards he was like I'm really sad I didn't get a picture of you petting the wombat (laughs) so you know it was like and I think about the cards in that way I mean there are a lot of people who don't like going outside and don't like and there are many good reasons right like who feels safe in a national park who feels safe you know being outside who can access it um and I I think I, one of the things I like about the deck is that it helps, I hope, build a personal relationship with plants and animals um, and to maybe invite a deeper relationship. Like, even if it's like, oh, I wonder what my spider plant is thinking. Where's my spider plant, (laughs) you know, in my pot, in my house, maybe teaching me. So, so Mm -hmm. yeah, that is this invitation for sure for sure so um i wonder if maybe you would take a moment and uh pull a card for uh for our listeners and uh just see who would like to come come through and uh speak to the listeners who might be here with us today beautiful all right do we have a specific question or are we just going to ask Typically, I do like to ask a specific question, but because there are so many listeners um, okay. and I, I think uh, I would just like to hear from whoever would like to come through. All right. I'm giving us a quick shuffle and we will see. Oh, goodness. Blue Sage. Mm. Um, Blue Sage is the sage that is um, native to to Kansas, native to the tall grass prairie region. And the um, value that I associated with Blue Sage is interdependence. Um, So I'm going to I'm going to read. Read this. Blue Sage. Salvia Azuria, interdependence. Oftentimes we feel like we have to go it alone. When overwhelmed with struggle, it's easy to retreat inward and feel too ashamed to ask for help. We live in a society that values independence above all else and makes it feel like a personal failure when we need help. This card is here to remind you that you are part of a community and that we all thrive when we support and depend upon each other. If you are struggling, reach out to friends and to those who love you. If you are thriving, take this moment to see how you can elevate others through your own success. This is a time to share your resources, time, and energy. Like the plants and animals and other beings of the prairie, we're all connected. Each decision and action we make has a larger impact. Our interdependence is a source of strength and can be celebrated. In late summer, blue sage, goldenrod, and blazing star bloom profusely together on the prairie. So this is happening right now. Blue sage, who has a tendency to lodge or flop over, especially in rich soils, literally depends on others around them to help hold them up. In a plant community with grasses and other clumps to lean on, they thrive. So that feels Mm -hmm. like an answer to our conversation and also a matching Mm -hmm. with our our (laughs) sartorial forest theme. (laughs) Indeed. Indeed it is. So um, would you tell me a little bit about... um, the, you how your writing process uh, in that one like tell me tell me about your relationship to blue sage and how you came to associate it with interdependence and this kind of thing ooh well 
Blue Sage was one of, this was actually one of the last cards that we added to the deck. Um, and it's kind of, it, it feels like there's something special about Blue Sage that's still a mystery to me, um, both the plant. And when we did a test um, print of the deck itself, um, early on, there was a mishap and um, there was no Blue Sage. There were two of, I'm forgetting which card we had two of, but there was no Blue Sage. And so I feel like um, there's something going on with Blue Sage. Um, part of it was spending time with them and seeing them that they are, at least in my observations, that they were really intermixed with other plants in the in the prairie. I mean, and this is how prairie plants, most of the plants in the deck grow is in community. Um, but I think part of it also was thinking about like what hadn't explicitly been said in the deck, like in thinking about like the core, I think interdependence is probably, you know, especially thinking about like queer and disability culture, right? Like thinking about the idea of, you know, thinking about interdependence maybe as extension of, of this kind of care work, right? And this idea of, you know, of resisting the sense of radical independence, right? And always creating something, um, always creating something new and leaving the old behind. Like it feels to me like this. So, um, so yeah, I think, I think I probably was thinking about interdependence and thinking about how to incorporate it and Blue Sage spoke to me and it, yeah. I guess this is the card that I, I hadn't thought about before, but that has more mystery to me in it than some of the others, so. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, that feels perfect. I'm so glad that we are able to lean into this kind of mystery and uh, hopefully link up our arms here and our fingers and our tendrils and uh, remember how we are all in community together, how we are in a community with our relatives and um, how joyous we are to be a, a part of that community and to take responsibility for our piece of that community. So um, thank you so much for being here today. Um, so if people are interested, they can find Prairie Divination wherever books are sold. Is that right? Uh, we have limited distribution. Um, I think we're covered. We're co um, carried at Skylark Books in Columbia, Missouri, and at The Raven in Lawrence, Kansas, and some, some, um, some divination oracle shops around the country. But the easiest way to get a hold of it is to order it direct through our website, aprairiedivination.com, or you can come to my website, which is just megankaminsky.com, and that links to everything. So it will awesome. be Yes, and there will be links um, in the, the show notes for all of that. Uh, thank you so much, Megan, for being here. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for inviting me, Zamboni. I'm just so happy to, to be in this space with you. For sure, for sure. Uh, so thank you all to the community for being here and for listening to us uh, talk about whatever it is that we felt like talking about. Thank you for rocking with us. If you are interested in an astrology reading, you can get uh, an hour-long session with me uh, like this where we do Zoom and all that. Um, and Or you can get a 10-minute reading like my weeklies, or you can get Zamboni Funk merch. You can find music. There's all sorts of stuff that you can find at ZambonyFunk.com. Thank you all so much for being here. I look forward to seeing y'all next time. Bye.